Good morning. We welcome you to this time of worshiping and sharing together in Christ. Uh, it's sprinkled, so some people will miss today, but <laughs> we're glad to have all of you here, and we're hoping that they're out there online with the folk who are tuning in now to this time of worship. Oh, in case you hadn't noticed up on the screen, it's Mother's Day, and we will honor our mothers and every lady here can wind up with a flower or two out there just as a part of our appreciation for you and love for you and the very necessity of you. And we are not honoring birth persons, we're honoring mothers. <laughs> That's my line for the day. <laughs> we have a couple, three announcements we could make real quickly here at the beginning. If you want to text, put welcome, and you will get a response back from us for sure if you're a guest. The n other number there is from members. If you want a response, put something in. We will get back with you and help you get whatever information you need. Uh, you can submit a prayer request and we will enter that on our next prayer list that comes out with, a, with our uh, newsletter. And uh, you can submit that prayer request and we'll start praying now, but it will also be recorded that way. I've got one other thing that I need to cover. If you would like to work with the Cass County Health Department, uh, where they're wanting people to prep for disaster response from the ch churches, and uh, so if if you're interested in that, well, I'd be glad to let you pick up that paper there. It says Cass County on the top of it, and we're glad to have each of you here. Let's begin by singing our prayer. to you praying for our country at this time. Bless us. Help us to walk in liberty, to walk in the law, to be strong for you, and to lead the nation back to the God who blessed its founding. Bless us again, Father. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This one, I'm going to sing the first line, and you repeat the line back at So you can't say I've never heard it, because you'll have just heard it after I sing the first line. <laughs> Hail Jesus, you're my King. Hail Jesus, you're my King. Your life frees me to sing. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. In all your ways, you perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. I will obey your word. I want to see your kingdom come. I want to see your kingdom come. Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You will take me into the land. You will take me into the land. We will conquer in your name. We will conquer in your name. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. And proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, 
hail, line of Judah. Hail, hail, line of Judah. How powerful you are. Christ is King. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Sing to the Lord, give Him the glory. Let there be praise, let there be joy in our hearts. Forevermore, let His love fill the air, and let there be praise. Amen. We we'll just continue praising him right now. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know. Is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Step by step we're moving forward. Little by little taking ground. Every prayer a powerful weapon. Strongholds come tumbling down and down and down and down. We want to see Jesus lifted high. A banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. I like that boom, boom, boom drum solo there. <laughs> Livens sings up. <laughs> Joy is going to be my strength. The 
though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes with the morning. I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of say yes Lord is one of the hard lessons in life sometimes isn't it because we usually are saying me Lord me Lord me Lord I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to be His dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to His holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. than anything this world affords today. Amen. Thank you all. We'll get that we shall be holding in yet. <laughs> We edit the song service as we go a little bit because we try to have enough to fill the time so that we start the sermon on time.
for sake of the broadcast and uh, <laughs> sometimes it uh, it gets tricky for me but we, we usually manage to make it pretty well don't forget you can text during the service put the volume to nothing on your phone so it doesn't ring through and you can just text away to us we'd be happy to have you do that and, and to respond we're going to talk about two roads and two gates today let's have a, a moment of prayer as we prepare ourselves to continue with the sermon on the mount lord we stand before you in need in need of you in need of your strength in need of your help in need of you walking with us every day bless us father lead us in the paths that we should walk in help us to stand for you to let the world know there is a god and his son's name is jesus we pray in jesus name amen most of the principles of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount have already been covered now. He makes these principles clear to us in the early stages. At this point, He begins to call for action. It's not enough just to say, well, you need to believe this. This is the way it is. It's only enough if you act upon it. Now, we had last week the last of those teachings and probably the most important one in the whole bunch. It says there, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. If you want to obey God, that's what you have to do. And it's timely that we looked at that last week because in our country... We're in a mess. And we're in a mess for a very good reason. Uh, somebody did something quite illegal, and at least unseemly, and leaked out what the Supreme Court was working on. Now, I don't back off from what people consider to be political issues if they're moral issues, okay? We're supposed to speak on those, and if you don't have a little Elijah in you, you need to get out of the pulpit. We need to take that kind of a stand. So, Roe may be set aside. What, what does that mean? It doesn't mean much. Not really. It doesn't make a change if they do that. All they're doing is ruling on whether Roe was a legal law or not. That's it. The row opened abortion from any time from conception to birth. And that's the way it still technically stands before the court. And that's the way it will continue to stand before the court because we have a federal government. Go read about it. The federal government has limited powers. Guess who's got the other powers? the states and we the people and when courts rule on things and forbid them or do things like that they create a problem what is to take place now is probably if this is overturned we will see legislatures be able to set the standard and you may have two states side by side who have completely different abortion laws and rules that's just the way that it's going to come out. But for the first time since Roe v. Wade, we have a say. And we can count as Christians in standing up. Now, I want to comment on a couple of things that are very unbiblical that are going on in society. I saw some poor folk with a Catholic church who have been very strong against abortion. Somebody had painted it's my body on the front of their church spray painted it on there it's not that's a lie 
You see, in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, the 19th verse following, it simply states that the Holy Spirit indwells you and you are not your own. It's not your own body. You were bought with a price. The price of Jesus' blood, actually. So, that's just not quite right. The text that we studied last week applies to this particular situation in this way. We are supposed to do what? Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. Since there are two beating hearts after six weeks in a woman's body, there are two humans to consider. We need to reckon with that. Put yourself in place of the yet unborn child. That's what the Scriptures say to do. And after Jesus teaches that, we have something to base what we do on. I'm through with that. But if I didn't say something about it, I would be much less than a preacher of the full Gospel. Thanks for bearing with me. If you want to crack me over the head later, do it gently. I'm bald and it really cuts up. <laughs> So, Jesus moves from these principles and that most important principle we call the golden rule. And He moves into what we need to be doing. And He says, this is a tale of two cities. <laughs> One city, He says, is named destruction. The other city is named life. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way narrow that leads to life. And there are few who find it. That's what it's about. Jesus maps it out for us. There is a wide gate and the other is narrow. A wide road and the other is narrow. The broad road and one very restricted. Jesus maps it out and we must choose. He has told us of His kingdom and He asks us to seek citizenship in His kingdom by going down that narrow path through that narrow gate. Now, this is where man always stands. We always wind up at the crossroads. And we have a decision to make and a direction to take. In a life filled incessantly with decisions, this is the ultimate decision. Joshua called for the people of Israel to make this kind of a decision. He stood before them and said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He says, You're at a point where you better make a decision. You see? Jesus did that. Rather uniquely, in the sixth chapter of John, the, the, the second verse, it says that the people, the great crowds that were following Him, were following Him because He was working miracles. And Jesus then preached the sermon on the bread of life. And they listened to it and they said, huh, that's a little hard to, to deal with. And many, it says in the 66th verse of that chapter, many of the disciples withdrew and were not with Him any more. There are choices that have to be made and Jesus actually pushed one of those choices. So Jesus roughly at this point is saying in this sermon, you've heard all these teachings and that you're marveling at them. Okay, fine, that's great. Don't admire my words. Do not admire my delivery. Decide. That's what He's saying. Decide. And that's what we just read in verses 13 and 14. We need to choose with discernment. And to do that, we need to take a close look at this passage of Scripture. First, we have what's clear cut. There's a narrow road and there's a broad road. There's a narrow way, a broad way. This is not a choice between Christianity and hellish, brutal living. It's not that kind of choice. 
You see, the choice is divine, inspired, given religion, and man-made religion, or man invented within his own heart to decide how he will try to honor God. You cannot choose your own system. You cannot invent your own system. There is only one way to get right with the system, and that's get right with a book that He gave us through the Holy Spirit, who is part of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We must deal in that way. We must decide and act in that way. So it's a clear-cut choice. And sometimes we don't choose what we would choose if we had read Scripture. We choose what we want to do to make God happy. Oh, you know, I, I'm a good person. Occasionally I drop in a church, so, you know, that'll take care of it all. No, it doesn't. You see, we're, it's not our personal accomplishment that we showed up at church or that we were nice to people. It's our accomplishment that we are on fire for Jesus Christ. We must be committed totally to Him. In Revelation 3, Jesus said, to John, I want you to understand something, John. People who are not wholeheartedly committed, who are self-righteous and lukewarm, make me sick, and I will vomit them out of my mouth. That's a very free translation, but a good one. When you are seeking justification by any law, Galatians 5.4 says, You are fallen from grace. It is not the law that saves you. It is Jesus Christ who saves you. He said, I am the door. The Scriptures say He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through Him. We're taught then there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism as we study the Scriptures. That's a narrow way. One, one, one. You got it? doesn't say there are three ways. Now you can... <laughs> no. No. It's a narrow way and it's narrow from the beginning and it will stay narrow. We have too many who make no commitment to Christ and then the church. We have people who don't take Jesus at His Word that the only way is that narrow way and we must live in a way that pleases our God as we walk along that way. Now, we're in a world that's gone nutty and it's been doing that for years because several years ago I clipped out a little article by Gallup. You know who they are. They're the Poland people. And he found out in a thing that he did on religion in America, he found out that the behavior of the churched and the unchurched over a wide range of items including lying, cheating, pilferage, you know, that there was very little difference between the ones who said they were Christians and the ones who weren't. That's sad. That's very sad. What he said was another way of saying that the attitude of many Christian people is, Lord, my will be done, not yours. And that just misses the whole thing. We need, we need Jesus. And we need to walk in the way that He says in the book. There's not any other choice that will make you a part of His kingdom here and eternally. It's solitary. That's what the choice is. You enter alone. One time, not too many years ago, we, we went to a theme park that shall remain nameless and shall not be visited again. And they had what's called a turnstile there. And you stepped up to the turnstile and you pushed on the turnstile and then you st as you stepped through it, it rolled up the next thing. You remember three of those little things on them? They had to put those things away. Now they don't use those even at stadiums. You want to know why? Because they've got to scan you. <laughs> what a society. So, 
I stepped through that thing and I was a little exuberant with my push and I hit myself in the backside with the next one coming up because I went down too far with it and I jumped and I kind of went whoop <laughs> and my family went whoop the rest of the day at me. <laughs> I'm saying that because we're going through a turnstile one at a time. The Jews thought that because they were children of Abraham, they could all go through together. No, it's a narrow gate and you go through it alone. You cannot go through it with your parents. You cannot go through it with your spouse. No, you must go through it by your choice, by your volition. There's somebody always waiting on somebody, you know, to become a Christian. Don't you all wait. Become a Christian and help the others become a Christian with what you've learned. We can't even get into heaven and we cannot even get in through that narrow gate if we have a church membership. Because it's not a church membership that saves you. It's the Lord Jesus who saves you being added to His kingdom church. What's needed? Personal commitment. It's a personal choice. One at a time go through that. And you know, there's those people out there in the world that just they say, Oh, preacher, I, I, I would do something about that, but I've been trying to find myself. Now that's ridiculous. Where would you have lost yourself? But even if you were trying to find yourself, the simple answer is commitment to the narrow one way through Jesus Christ. That will solve the problems eventually. Because He'll be involved in the problems with you. We need to be committed to Jesus Christ. We need to become His child. We are unique. We are loved. We are part of a family. We are saved. We are purified. We are heaven bound. And we are not enslaved by sin. We are overcomers regarding to the, the trials of this world. All of this because of our personal commitment to Jesus Christ. All we are comes from that commitment from that narrow way. Now why do churches sometimes fail? Because they fail to hold up the narrow way. If you look around the country, you will see major denominations shrinking. It's happening. It was happening before COVID. Don't blame it on that. It was happening then. Do you know why they've been shrinking? Because they forgot about the God of the Bible. Because they forgot that they belong to Jesus. And that's the choice. They don't have a right to vote on what's right for the church to do. They don't have right to issue edicts from the top of the church down about what people in the church are supposed to do. They only have a right to take out the Word of God and present it and ask people to live by it. That's it. Period. Nothing more, nothing less. There is no structure over us. In fact, when you get that structure over you, you lose your freedom because you have a man dictating to you what he thinks you ought to be doing. And actually, you need to have the Holy Spirit through the Word of God dictating to you what you should be doing. If people are left out of the church, it will be their choice. It will be the directions that they have chosen that have led to that. So, with Jesus, a commitment to Him causes us to put aside all other things. We must have that commitment. And it's your choice. Your choice to make. The choice also is the world or Jesus. They talk about Christian worldview. Have you heard somebody use that term? You have, if you've listened to some of my sermons, because I mention it occasionally. There is a Christian worldview, and then there is a worldview. It's one or the other. There's no happy middle ground. You choose the narrow way, and you move away from this world. You move away from this world and its values. The world lives an utterly empty life, really. And they move from one round of pleasure to the other, and they gain nothing of value, and they gain no satisfaction in that, ultimately. What could be gained from the praise of men? What could be gained from living like the world? 
emptiness abounds. In their blindness, they grope on and the narrow way is missed. We must enter by the narrow way. We must repent. <laughs> that means give up ourselves and our ways and accept God's ways. That's what repentance means. It means to turn. Literally, that's what the word in the Greek means. If you want to know a little Greek. The fact is it's like with a girl who came up to another girl and she said, I understand that John and you are engaged now. And the girl said, yes. She said, did you know that he proposed to me first? And the girl said, well, no, no. I don't think he mentioned that. But he told me that he'd done a lot of foolish things in his past. <laughs> That's where we are. We've all done foolish things in our past. And we all need to repent of our sin. We must not be doing what everyone else is doing. We must not be believing what everybody else is believing. We should be different from the world. Our lifestyle will not be popular. The young people's cry, everybody's doing it! Doesn't hold up. We won't conform. We won't fit in, consequently. We live as a rebuke right in the face of the world as we serve the Lord. Romans 13.14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. You see, that's where you're getting in trouble with sin when you have the lusts working. There was a father who told his kids, said, don't go in the river swimming. At least for now, it's just not safe. The water's up. It's, it's not safe. Don't go to the river swimming. Next day, here came the kid home with his swimsuit wet. Father said, where have you been? He said, oh, sw 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 swimming in a river. Didn't I tell you not to swim there? Yes, sir. Why did you? Well, I had my bathing suit with me and I couldn't resist the temptation. And he said, why did you have your bathing suit with you? He said, well, so I'd be prepared to swim in case I was tempted. <laughs> and sometimes that's the way people deal with temptation in their life. Too many of us expect to sin. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. We are Spirit-filled and our deportment must be different from the world. The spirit of worldliness must be gone. Spurgeon said this, You and your sins must separate. Or you and your God will never come together. Choose the world or choose Jesus. It is a choice. And it is a costly choice. Some people sell the idea that the church is easy. They sell the idea that being a Christian is just really simple. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is blessed by God. But it ain't easy, people. Christ is too honest to invite us to follow Him in that way. He uncompromisingly states that it's a narrow way. And to walk in it means that we have to take up our cross and follow Him. To walk in it means that we must have humility. It's a little wonder that many people don't find that way. They're looking for the easy believism that a lot of churches say. Raise your hand and you're saved. Hey, don't you think that you're saved because you raised your hand? Don't think you're saved just because you said a couple of words that were right. Because if you do not hear the Word of God and do it, that's what Jesus is talking about. You have no place in the kingdom of heaven. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus walked away with suffering 
we are going to suffer because we don't look like and live like the world. It's costly to become a Christian. Do we suffer? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Jesus just told us that in, in the fifth chapter. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said we must give up earthly relationships. We must put them second. You can't take holidays from the spiritual life. There's always, always temptation. And temptation will dog our steps. We wrestle against principalities and powers and darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, the Scriptures say. We must strive and agonize over this. They describe this life as a gut-wrenching race. The long distance that you're going to run until you finish it. A fight. A war, if you please. Satan started the lies about easy Christianity. There isn't any easy Christianity. There are people who come to church and try to find that easy Christianity. There was one fellow who was kind of defending himself because he never did anything at church and never did anything for the church. And he said, look, why don't you get off my back about this? I'm doing everything that the pastor asked me to do when I joined. When I joined, the pastor took my hand and said, have a seat, please. And I did. <coughs> That's not the way it works. There's no easy way offered in Jesus. Outside of Him, there is a broad, easy way. But it won't take you where you want to go. We must deny ourselves to make the journey. There was a young man referred to as the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus told him what he would have to do. And there was just one thing that he didn't want to do. And he went away sorrowful because he had to do it all. There is a narrow way. It's little wonder that few find it. In fact, sometimes I think few seek it. There was a man and his wife... Both passed away and they took different routes into eternity. She went to heaven. See, it's Mother's Day. I had to make it her going to heaven. And soon she discovered that there was telephone service. So she put in a call to her husband and he was in the other place. And she said, how do you like it down there? He said, oh, it's not too bad. I have to wear horns and a red suit and shovel some coal, but I only have to work two hours a day. How are you doing up there? She said, my goodness, we, we get up at 4 a.m. together in the stars and we have to haul in the moon and hang the sun and all day long we're rolling clouds around. He said, how come you work so hard? She says, well, tell the truth, we're short-handed up here. <laughs> and that is the way few there be who find it. We have a destiny. We have a place then that we're going. Our choice is our destiny. Both paths that we've talked about lead somewhere. No one starts down a road without knowing where it leads. Except on occasional trips when my navigator got me on the wrong place. <laughs> or sometimes I got on the wrong place. Don't ever let them tell you the story about Copan, Oklahoma. That's where I wound up from back roads when I thought I had a shortcut to get someplace I was going. My family makes that come to life regularly. No, my friends, if there's a broad interstate going the wrong way, don't take it. Because it's better to be on a narrow path that takes you where you want to go. The broad way looks inviting. No rules. You can go with the flow. Do you know who goes with the flow? Dead fish. There seems to be a way that might be right in man's eyes, but the end thereof is death, the Scriptures say. There is a constricted, pressed together, narrow way. It could be translated any of those ways, but that leads to life. 
giving up on this world can seem hard. But there's a blessing in it. There's a blessing in it. There was a retired bachelor who made out his will and he told the lawyer to divide his state equally among four ladies. He said, you write this down. Each of them refused my proposal of marriage. And to their refusals, I owe all my earthly happiness. <laughs> there may be moments of pain, but self-denial pays off in eternal happiness. When worldly men reach the end of their lives, their greatness is quickly lost. Especially if you have a culture like ours that's destroying history. <laughs> When we reach the end of life, we find out that we only have what we take before God in judgment. And a lot of people die wealthy, able to buy whatever they want for their misery, but unfulfilled. All that people have sought in this life is gone when they leave this world, unless they've made arrangements with Jesus to send it on ahead. The most important thing about our destiny makes it imperative we decide. To not make the decision and do something is actually to choose the broad way that leads to destruction. That's the name of the city there, remember? How many of you want to go on vacation to destruction? <laughs> not me. And I would never allow a town that I was going to live in be named that. Terrible. Destruction is hell. The call is to respond to the king and his kingdom with a resounding yes. I'll walk with you. I'll walk the way you want me to go. I will take that narrow path and go through that narrow gate. There's no other choice for eternity that's worth making. So choose the narrow gate, the narrow straight way that leads us to life. To life. We're going to have a moment where we will be taking communion after we are offering an invitation song, people can come forward and make public decisions during this time. Those of you who are online, submit a request and we will contact you and help take your decision from you. We have these little cups. If you don't have one, raise your hand. we got a couple of three people here, that one on one side and one on the other. Keep your hand up until they get to you. It will just take a few moments. We're going to meet around the Lord's table right after we have this time of invitation. We will be singing, Fill My Cup, Lord. It's a surrender of life. satisfaction is in that kind of surrender. Jesus called attention to His surrender when He gave His life on the cross for us. He said, my body is represented by this and it's broken for you.
And then he took the cup and said, this cup represents the new covenant, the agreement between you and God that's made in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me until I come again. I would remind you that there are flowers out there for every mother and every lady. And if you're a young lady, you can still get a flower or two. It's okay. We call you a mother probably in the future anyway. So we want you to be honored by that. Uh, I don't want to say very much about it, but I just want to say a word about mothers. Uh, there's a story I read once, and the story was about a man who kept saying, "Why, why don't I have an angel to help me get through life?" Have you read that? And what it comes down to each time is, I gave you a mother to be that angel. Sometimes there are people who act as, as that. And we definitely want to honor them today. So mothers, happy Mother's Day. God bless you. <laughs> Would you lead us in prayer, brother? Just come right over. I, I don't know how far that microphone will go. You need to step up, I think. It's an honor for me to pray today on this special day. As you all know, and we've heard several times, this is Mother's Day. What would we do without our mothers? <laughs> mothers have helped families together forever. When I was a kid growing up, they used to say, a man works from sun to sun, but a woman's work is never done. <laughs> and that's just about the way a mother is. She's usually the first one up and the last one to go to bed. Mothers are special. We could never thank them enough for all they've done for us. Lord, we thank you that you have sent mothers to us. That you... We couldn't be born without mothers, Lord. But Lord, thank you for choosing the mothers that we have. As you have said, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. You knew who our mothers were going to be long before we were born, Lord. And we thank you for spend, sending us special mothers. Lord, be with us now. Forgive us where we fail thee. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>